It's estimated by the International Energy Agency that on a global basis, the oil industry is underinvesting in sustaining capital to the tune of about a billion U.S. dollars per day. This underinvestment isn't felt in 2024, maybe even 2025. But in 2026 or 2027, a systematic underinvestment of $365 billion a year impairs the ability of producers to maintain production. Let's look at what happens when you do that. There are two instructive lessons. Rick, how are you? Andy, I'm doing very well. The better for being on talking to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming up on board again on such a little notice. What if you said something in our previous conversations, we were talking about how you really cut your teeth or you have a huge background in oil and gas and how oil and gas interests you so much on many different levels. And as I shared with you off camera, it has such a big interest with me just because of my grip background coming from Alaska. And then number two, really just how I see just such deep value in the equities. And then three is um, just, I think we're going into a, a, a possible big time energy crunch here. So let's start with that. Let me get your views. Let's start with oil and natural gas. Let's talk about the valuations, not the companies, we'll go into that later, but the just where the price is at and are, do you see us going into in energy crunch here in the next five years? Well, it's important to say that at least four times in my career, let's say four times in my memory, the price of oil fell below the cost, <laughs> the price of oil fell below the cost of production. So can oil prices go lower, even dramatically lower? Yes. You'll recall in COVID that oil prices went sub-zero before settling out at $20 a, par a barrel. Uh, it's important to note that the International Energy Agency suggested that the fully loaded cost to produce a barrel of oil was 60 bucks. So the industry would make the stuff for 60, sell it for 20, lose 40, and do it 80 million times a day. Uh, this gets rather boring, uh, and the truth is it doesn't last very long. But as an example, to prepare your listeners psychologically to become oil and gas investors, Let's imagine just for fun that peace broke out between Russia and the Ukraine and Russian oil and Russian natural gas were allowed to flow freely without sanctions to the West. Let's imagine further that both the Saudis and the Iranians decided to maintain their market share as lower cost producers pumping more oil to freeze the Russians out of the market and maintain their revenues. Could the price of oil fall from $65 or $70 to $45 or $50 a barrel? Yes. Okay. Yes, it could happen. As an investor, you need to understand that. You also need to understand that much of the recent uh, decrease in the price of oil has to do with U.S., not Russian or Saudi production. Uh, and that U.S. production is due to a conjunction of technologies uh, that have enabled us, particularly in the Permian Basin in West Texas, to make to transform the U.S. from the largest petroleum importer in the world to a petroleum exporter, uh, to in fact double production uh, from the most heavily drilled strata on Earth. This is important to understand because I would suggest to you that the gains that have come from the production that exists today have been maximized that without new technologies around drilling or around reservoir stimulation, that the number of undrilled A-grade locations in the Permian, in the Marcellus, in the Eagle Ford, in the Scoop Stack, uh, the suggestion is that we've probably now drilled 70 or 75% of the A-grade locations. So without either a rapid decline in the cost of capital, which is to say, vastly lower interest rates or improvements in production, that we have probably seen the eclipse in the rise of U.S. production. 
Let's take a look at something else. On a global basis, the uh, merge, the move into the lower cost, uh, lower cost has been largely a function, again, of the U.S. and the very low cost of capital. On a global basis, it's estimated now that the marginal production takes place at uh, costs that are in excess of the selling price of that oil. Further, it's estimated by the International Energy Agency that on a global basis, the oil industry is underinvesting in sustaining capital to the tune of about a billion U.S. dollars per day. This underinvestment isn't felt in 2024, maybe even 2025. But in 2026 or 2027, a systematic underinvestment of $365 billion a year impairs the ability of producers to maintain production. Let's look at what happens when you do that. There are two instructive lessons. PETAVESA, the National Oil Company of Venezuela, has mm -hmm. systematically underinvested in sustaining capital for 25 years, and they've reduced their productive capacity by 80%. The largest known recoverable oil reserves on the planet are in Venezuela, and PETAVESA has lost 80% of their production capability, not as a consequence of geology, but rather as a consequence of deferred sustaining capital investments. The second example would be Mexico, Pemex, uh, again, a state-owned firm, which again has milked their oil company for dividends to maintain politically expedient domestic spending programs, including ironically subsidizing kerosene and gasoline, uh, subsidizing the consumption of products that they haven't spent enough time producing. Uh, in this case, much like Petavesa, the producing capability of PMEX, uh, including cratering their best oil field, Cantoral, as a consequence of deferred sustaining capital investments, has reduced the, the pr producing capability of PMEX by 80%. One needs to look for oil and gas companies that are solidly profitable at $60 a barrel mm. that uh, are able to, as a consequence of high free cash flows, reinvest sufficiently in sustaining capital investments and, if possible, in new project investments so that they can take advantage of this systematic underinvestment around the globe. So that leads me to a question then, should an investor even touch or look at juniors then um, because of just really where the price of oil is at and that the more the, or they very well could run out of money before they uh, could take advantage of this? That's a function of how hard the speculator wants to work. The speculating in oil and gas investment, in oil and gas exploration, has been extremely good to me, but I grew up in it. Uh, I'm willing to do the work. Uh, I'm willing to make endless phone calls. I'm willing to take political risk. I'm willing to take technical risk. I'm willing to be wrong. Uh, in, investors who aren't um, metaphorically uh, ready to suit up for a rodeo shouldn't ride that horse. Uh, speculation's been important to me. I need to say that I think the juxtaposition of risk to reward in the oil business is so good that right now, for most people, I would rather see them be investors than speculators. I think there's enough money to be made on the big stocks that you don't need to go down the quality trail too much, despite the fact that I do it. Well, let, on that note, if we can, let's start with a, a big stock. Well, it's big is relative. Let's start with Devon Energy. And I've been looking at Devon Energy for a while, and why I like them, really what's attracted to me, if you look at a one-year chart, and I know you don't play one-year charts, but if you look at a one-year chart, stock's pretty cheap. It's at a roughly 50% haircut, and it also pays a 5% dividend. Tell me about Devon Energy. Is this a value still that you would be attractive to you? I own a lot of Devon. It's sold off because their principal product is natural gas. Right. Natural gas is in oversupply in the United States as a consequence of the fact that it's produces a byproduct of producing oil. Two things. We already talked about the fact that from my point of view, the number of grade A locations in the Permian 
which would co-produce gas is falling. But the second thing is that natural gas itself, U.S. natural gas, is simply too cheap. Uh, the same gas that sells at Henry Hub, uh, the most important clearing point for natural gas in the U.S., for $2 per U.S., $2 U.S. per million BTU, that same gas sells in Rotterdam, Shanghai, or Tokyo for $8 as liquefied natural gas. It costs about two bucks a million cubic feet, a, a million BTU, to get that gas from Henry Hub to water uh, to uh, Rotterdam. So you add two bucks and a buck and a half, you get three fifty for a product that sells for eight. Now, uh, this arbitrage is too big to last, and it won't last. It's being addressed by the investment of billions of dollars monthly in gas gathering, in gas processing in gas transmission, in gas liquefaction, in gas deliquefaction, and, uh, less obviously, in the onshoring to the U.S. Gulf Coast of European manufacturers that would rather pay $2 per million BTU than $8 per million BTU. Basically, the German petrochemical and fertilizer industries are re relocating from Germany to the U.S. Gulf Coast. I believe that the arbitrage between U.S. natural gas prices and European natural gas prices will collapse, not as a consequence of the fall of the European prices, because natural gas is already cheaper than oil. There's a whole second arbitrage. Will this take place in 2025? Probably not. 2026, I'm not certain. What I do know is that over five years, the arbitrage between $3.50, which is to say, the production and distribution uh, cost, and $8, the price of that material in uh, Shanghai or Tokyo or Rotterdam is too big to go away. Let's talk about uh, another company here, Africa Oil. Um, I was looking and have been looking at them for really the past uh, past year, they had a really great spike up in the uh, in the summertime. I want to say I'm just thinking from memory, and then they sold off recently here. Yeah, give me your opinion on the stock. Why did they sell off? And they look really, really attractive from a value standpoint here. Uh, two comments here. First of all, conflict of interest. I'm a founding shareholder of Africa Oil, uh, yeah, going bad. back into the Paleolithic, going way, way, way back. Uh, and I have owned it and traded it successfully for a very, very long time. The second disclaimer is that this stock is speculative. Uh, it is selling for less than half of what it's worth on a net present value basis. But that net present value is mostly in Nigeria, uh, which has its own set of political risks. The stock traded up because the company participated in the discovery of the Venus field in uh, offshore Namibia. Uh, and when the market came to understand that free cash flow from Venus wouldn't occur for four years and would entail very large capital expenditures in the period of, in, over the next four years, the various stocks associated with the Venus discovery sold off. Uh, in the meantime, Africa Oil consolidated its interest in Nigeria, buying out the private equity partner. So it is now the third largest offshore producer in Nigeria. Over the last six years, Africa Oil has paid off the acquisition debt associated with buying the Nigerian asset. This is important because now the free cash flow from Nigeria can go to uh, exploring, uh, looking after what I consider to be the extraordinary technical upside in Nigeria. What could go wrong? Well, Nigeria could go wrong. There are a lot of things in Nigeria, including endemic corruption, that could go wrong. The second is that my read of the exploration upside could be wrong. Uh, uh, exploration isn't a certain science. Uh, for speculators who are willing to buy a stock that could triple or quadruple on exploration news in either Nigeria or to a lesser extent Ni uh, Namibia, who are willing to take the Nigerian political risk, the idea that you can avail yourself of this 
at a greater than 50% discount to the net present value of the existing proved developed producing reserves is attractive. I also need to say that the gentleman who created all that value, Keith Hill, the guy I backed when I became a founding shareholder uh, of Africa Oil, has now resigned. And it's important to note that the creator of that track record is no longer with the company. Okay. I also, real quick, and I think you really hit on two really good things. You hit on the ones I brought to you, one's a speculative asset. The other one, Devon Energy, has a great track record. Well, they both have great track records, but Devon Energy is a lot more, I don't know, has a lot, stable's the wrong word, but it's been not as many things he's the wrong is what I'm trying to say, and it's bigger. Um, talk to me about a big player, Exxon. If you're building an energy portfolio, what I typically try to do is get a really big company if you would, or a couple of big companies. And those, that's my star, if you would. And then I have all these little moons that I say circle around that. Exxon would be my star. What's your opinion on Exxon? And it has to do a lot of it with price stability, diversification, and a dividend. That's in my mind, though. I don't want to speak for you. Exxon's the finest natural resource company on the planet, irrespective of commodity produced. It has a wonderful 30-year track record of capital allocation. That isn't to say they haven't made the odd bad decision, they have. But right. if you look back over 30 years, as an example, their recycle ratio, which is their exploration efficiency, the uh, amount of net present value uh, that they can create per, bar per barrel of oil sold is extraordinary. Uh, while the whole, it, well, the industry as a whole is under investing in sustaining capital, Exxon is increasing their sustaining capital investments. Uh, at the same time, uh, Exxon has made a discovery offshore Guyana, now over 18 billion barrels, a discovery that's large enough to move the dial on a company the size of Exxon. While other companies are generating free cash flow, which they're returning to shareholders via dividends and buybacks, while Exxon has increased payouts to shareholders by 14%, they simultaneously spent $60 billion to buy Pioneer uh, in the Permian Basin. And importantly, they just didn't do, they didn't do it just to bulk up. There was an amazing hand-in-glove fit between Pioneer's assets and Exxon's assets, allowing Exxon to do much, much, much longer laterals uh, in their horizontal drilling. Uh, but it's important to note that while the industry as a whole is decapitalizing, Exxon is going harder. It, this is speculative, but my suspicion is over the next four years or five years, if you don't see your first question, Devon, increasing in price, you will see Devon in that circumstance be part of Exxon or be part of Chevron or, or be part of some major. Uh, in Devon, it's a case of like the old Purolator oil co oil filter commercial. Pay me now or pay me later. If their market capitalization stays low relative to peers, they will cease to exist. They will reappear as one of their peers. Excellent. Okay. So I'd like to get to uranium, but before we get to uranium, I want to do two things. Um, if you can comment about Building in just a few minutes, because man, we, we could spend a whole boot camp on this, and hopefully you do have a boot camp on this soon in the new year. Building an energy portfolio, obviously, and that's can be complex. But if somebody is just thinking, of my mother, Carol Nash, what would how would you build an energy portfolio? What's what are the first two or three things that you would recommend doing? You start with the best. Uh, in this particular case, you start with Exxon. Uh, what you find is that when you see, because resources are capital intensive and cyclical, when you see an energy bull market or a gold bull market for that matter, the market beta, beta in this case defined as the outperformance of the subject sec sector relative to the broad market, is so spectacular that you actually don't need to take speculative risk. 
Right. Uh, traditionally, in capital intensive businesses, the problem with that approach is if you're early, because of the time value of money, you're wrong. In the case of the high quality energy companies, their dividends are so high that you overcome the time value of money problem simply by way of dividends and distribution, which means you get paid to wait. So being paid to wait for an event where the outcome is certain and where the quantum of the outcome, which is to say the size of the outperformance relative to the broad market is so high, you overweight the, you overweight the portfolio with the biggest and best names. It's important that you just don't buy dividends. Yeah. Buy dividends from companies that are making enough sustaining capital investments that they can maintain production and maintain the dividends. Don't buy companies that are cannibalizing themselves. If you do, when the bull market comes, your stock will go down, not up. Uh, yes. Well, it's important to know that. But you you start an energy portfolio, I think, I was going to say, I was going to describe a class of stocks. No, you start an energy portfolio with Exxon. Now, that is great advice. And I, as I was saying, I had made that mistake so many times in the past. I just... I'd buy dividends if you would. Um, before we get to uranium, tell me about your services, just a free service. I think it's one of the best things on the internet or available anywhere about raking somebody's portfolio. Uh, sure. Tell me about that. Yeah, that's easy. Uh, if you like the way I think about natural resources, but you want to personalize it to your own portfolio, I do that for free. Go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com and list your natural resource stocks. Sidebar, please no crypto, please no pot stocks, please no tech stocks. I can barely, I can barely pronounce, let alone spell NVIDIA. So don't, don't do that to me. Uh, for no charge, no obligation, I will rank your portfolio uh, and I'll comment on individual issues if I think my comments might have value. The second thing that we have for free is the Rule Classroom. There are a couple hundred hours of interviews and instructional programming there. RuleClassroom.com. It's absolutely free. There's 13 and a half hours of instructional programming about how to understand mining and oil and gas. In addition, there's countless hours of interviews with me and other people. I am both being interviewed and interviewing. Rule Classroom. And it's all free. Uh... It's difficult for me not to give you your money's worth if I don't charge you anything. Okay, so let's get to uranium now. What I like about uranium is now that it's boring, it's out of the public eye, but it's not hated. Um, and it's certainly needed. So what are your thoughts on uranium over the next um, next while? Less fun than it was four years ago. You know, the hate trade, the hate trade is great. And all the thing has to do is become unaided and you get a triple. And yeah. that's what happened. It became untraded, un unaided, and I got a triple. So I need to say I've sold enough of my uranium juniors that I no longer have any net cash invested in them. I'm playing on the house's money. And I sold enough to pay the capital gains tax too. So I'm at what I laughingly call the point of no concern uh, as differentiated from the point of no concern, which is what happens when you overstay your welcome. But I think looking five years ahead, there's a very fundamental and very positive change happening in the uranium space that if people understand it and are patient, they will do very well with. The uranium stocks are trading up now as a consequence of the narrative around small module reactors. And small module reactors will make a difference seven years from now, eight years from now, 10 years from now. They'll make no difference this year. The acceptance of small module reactors and the exception, the attractiveness of nuclear energy to the technology businesses is important. It signifies a broader public acceptance of uranium, which is deeply important to the thesis. But what matters in the near term, and by near term, I mean the next three to five years, is the following. New plant construction is taking place around the world, and it's being allowed. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, existing plants that were scheduled to be shut down, like Diablo Canyon in California, receive 20-year new permits. This impacts demand now, not seven years from now. 
And the new plant construction uh, requires the new plant builders to lock in enough fuel in term contracts to amortize the loan. Uh, Andy, if you were to go build a reactor, let's call it Andy's Power Company, and you were going to build a six or seven billion dollar reactor in, say, Taiwan, uh, the banks might loan you five billion dollars against it. And in order for you to receive that five billion dollar loan, you would have to lock in enough uranium supply on a contractual basis that you could amortize that five billion dollar loan over 15 or 20 years. The change that's taken place in the uranium business is that unlike any other commodity in the world, you can lock in price and volume in uranium for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Every other commodity, every other commodity, you're subject to the tyranny of overnight or spot markets. In the oil business, we don't know really if we're gonna get $65 or $85 or $45, we have no idea. You know, if, if the Israelis chuck a missile at Karg Island in Iran and Iran shuts down the States of Hormuz, you have $160 oil. If, by contrast, peace breaks out uh, between Russia and the Ukraine, you may have $45 oil. In the Iranian business, term agreements between sellers and investment-grade buyers allows certainty with regards to price and volume for years and years and years. This lowers the cost of debt capital because the lenders know they're going to get paid back. And it makes lazy securities analysts like Rick Rule uh, much more certain with regards to their uh, free cash flow and net present value analysis because it's spelled out on paper with investment grade counterparties. It's weird that this is the most important aspect of uranium stock valuation. And it's one that's known and understood by perhaps 1% of the punters in the space. Truly wild. Yeah, it's such a great point, too, because the two questions about that Rick ruled a banker that makes it very attractive to loan to uranium companies. Correct me if I'm wrong. And, and extremely attractive. And this and you brought it up the last time we talked that this might be coming to the lithium market, correct me if I'm wrong. And that would make it, not to talk about a lithium, but that would make it so attractive to lithium companies, correct? I'm working very hard to cause it to come to the lithium market. Well, well Godspeed. Uh, pardon? Godspeed. I, you know, I, I, I don't think that either the consumer nor the producer uh, is quite there yet, but we have a circumstance where development stage lithium properties are far too numerous. If there's 150 discoveries that were made in the next 10 years, perhaps six or eight of them will go into production in the next, in the next 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, those will have to deal with the fact that you that lithium is out of favor. So their cost of capital will be high. At the same time, lithium users remember a period five or six years ago where although elemental lithium wasn't in short supply, uh, the ability to turn that raw lithium into finished products was an extremely short supply. And so people who needed lithium couldn't get it. The Chinese are scrambling for access to high quality lithium. And they're having a field day getting it. Uh, and the West is scrambling for access to high quality lithium to compete with the Chinese. Uh, I think over the next two or three years, arrangements will be made by companies that have high quality lithium deposits, which can exist at today's lithium price and produce and consumers who want to lock in offtake for 15 years. Uh, I think you'll see upfront payments made or at least contracts guaranteed with regards to price and volume, like in the uranium space, so that parenthetically schlep, schmuck, and schmo lithium, who had no prayer of 
getting project financing, let alone on balance sheet financing for a lithium product, can take uh, uh, lithium purchase agreements, binding purchase agreements, with investment grade counterparties, say General Motors or Toyota or General Electric. And they can take those to the bank, get right. the mines built on a turnkey basis, and lower their cost of capital. Uh, maybe it's the fact that understanding that requires too much work. And people would rather say lithium is batteries. Batteries are good. Therefore, I buy. Um, but the prior technique makes more money than the latter technique. I hope you're successful. Uh, you know, it's, it's much bigger than me. It makes absolute sense. I could see, uh, I could see the Japanese trading companies, uh, perhaps on the, on behalf of the Japanese government do this. I could see CITIC, uh, China International Trade and Investment do this, but I also note, uh, that what you might describe as my former enemies, uh, the U S administration, the U S state department. Uh, are actively involved in trying to secure the raw materials that are necessary for the revitalization of American industrial base. There is uh, a real field in the Department of Commerce, uh, the Department of Defense, in the State Department that the United States needs to and therefore will uh, invest in financial strategies. Invest is a strange political term, shorthand for spend. Uh, in order to muscle the U.S. way back into these spaces. And I think that you'll see that occur in a broad range of materials. Uh, I think you'll see it occur in um, nickel. Uh, I certainly think you'll see it occur in raw er rare earths, probably in vanadium, and Honestly, probably uh, in lithium. Yeah, now, I, I'm talking three or four or five years out. And it's important to note that most speculators' time frames uh, are, you know, limited to before the next long weekend. Yeah. So I, I talked to a few CEOs. One of them was from a, a tungsten, uh, a tungsten company. And it was really that, that was the, pretty much the whole conversation was about securing him getting a government grant really to secure a tungsten deposit. Because I think that's right. Now, speculators need to be cautious about equating the fact with that the U.S. needs tungsten or that the world needs tungsten. Don't equate, equate that with any deposit because schlep, schmuck, and schmo deposits uh, aren't going to get done no matter how stupid our government is. It's important that if the broad narrative attracts you, that you apply the narrative to an economic deposit. Our most recent boot camp, Andy, uh, talked about tier one deposits. So if you're talking uh, about any of these materials, in order to minimize your risk and maximize your reward, you need to look for deposits that have over $10 billion in in situ recoverable reserves and resources at today's commodity price. You need to find deposits too, that on a global scale, relative to the commodity that they produce, uh, where they will be in the lowest cost quartile worldwide in the commodity that they produce. In other words, a tungsten deposit needs to be in the bottom quarter cost quartile worldwide, including existing Chinese production, which is a tough test. Finally, those deposits need to be able to be in the best quartile worldwide in return on capital employed but at any rate, greater than 25%. So if somebody has a Me Too, you know, tungsten deposit in, you know, East Armpit, Wisconsin, uh, and, and it's a crummy little deposit that has failed to attract investor attention for 100 years and won't matter to anybody, despite the fact that the local congressman is a champion of that project, it's unlikely that that project will make anybody any real money. Yeah. It's important that you combine 
a emerging positive narrative with attractive arithmetic. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And yes, thank you so much for that. And it goes back to our conversations of quality, quality names, and you bring up tier one deposit. So um, yes, thank you for that. Um, I was going to talk about ASCII going back to uranium, um, mega uranium. What are your thoughts on that? And I also want to just, I've kind of, and for my own detriment, I've shied away from companies in Australia for a lot of various reasons, but give me, get talk, tell me about Mega Uranium. I own Mega, although it violates several of my rules. <laughs> I own it because they've been around for a very long time, and these guys know Uranium. Most of the people running Uranium Juniors are people who failed at marijuana, they failed at gold, maybe they failed at lithium, you know, maybe they were in crypto for a while. Anyway, serial failures. The people who, without the stock market, would probably be selling used cars at a bad lot. Uh, the mega guys go back to the last iridium boom. Uh, they have a sister company, Laramide. Uh, the thing that's wrong with mega is I don't see any tier one deposits in mega. I see a collection of tier two deposits. I also, however, see what's in effect a closed end fund. Uh, mega uranium, if you look at the value of their shareholdings and other companies, is selling at a discount and you get the uranium assets for free. And I'm hugely attracted to free. Uh, right. If I'm right, uh, and we enjoy a period where decent lithium de uh, uranium deposits, including tier two deposits, can get funded off balance sheet uh, using contracts, then the liquidation value of the mega portfolio isn't double the current share price. It's a multiple of that. And I have very experienced commercial people in charge of the process that own a lot of stock. So although it values uh, my uh, tier one emphasis, uh, I own the stock. Okay, excellent. So Red, uh, moving into the new year here, two questions, final thoughts. I hope I get to spend time with you before January, but if I don't, happy new year, early new year to you, but I hope I get to talk with you before then. But some thoughts going into the new year and also you're going to have a boot camp, I'm sure, in January. Uh, and do you know what that is and how can people, um, how can people participate in that? For people who don't know what our boot camps are, they are eight hour long, very deep dives. Uh, on single subjects around natural resources. We did a silver boot camp, a uranium boot camp, a royalty and streaming boot camp, uh, a prospect generator and grassroots exploration boot camp. Uh, the last boot camp we did was on tier one deposits. Word of the wise, these are not for tourists. Uh, if you are in this business for entertainment, or if your investment thesis has got a hunch, bet a bunch, don't show up. Uh, we work you really hard for eight hours and we give you so much information in eight hours that you'll have to play the recording more than once. So budget 24 hours, we only charge you for eight. Uh, if you come and you don't think we give you your money worth, by the way, it's $99. Just email us. We'll give you the money back, full money back. No questions asked guarantee. We've been doing these, uh, educational products for 28 years. We've had a full money back guarantee for 28 years. We've had to refund less than one tenth of 1% of the tuitions we've charged, but nonetheless, it's there. We're going to do a gold boot camp. Uh, that'll be the next one. We're doing a bold, a gold boot camp because we asked our attendees what they want to cover next. And they said gold. To be honest with you, I'm unsure as to what aspect about gold we're going to do. Part of me thinks that this will be a physical gold boot camp, where we'll tell people why they might own physical gold and we'll tell people why they might not own physical gold. Uh, I think I'm going to get a bear on this boot camp. And then we're going to compare and contrast ways to own gold. Physical, ETFs, the gold trusts, the Mokata certificate, the Perth Mint certificate, 
discussing the pros and cons of physical gold ownership and the ownership of surrogates for physical gold. If we don't do that, we'll go right straight into a, a deep dive boot camp on gold equities. Uh, how to invest in gold equities, how to speculate in gold equities, the structure of a gold bull market, how the market moves from the biggest and the best to the second tiers, to the single asset producers, to the developers, to the explorers, how you play the game all the way along. Either way, uh, I promise you, we're going to work you really hard if you come. Uh, think of this as reading War and Peace, not the funnies. Uh, if your own reading habits, go to the uh, colored section of the Sunday paper, you know, the funny, the funny pages. Don't come. Don't come, because we're going to wait. We're going to work you way, way, way too hard. Uh, if you have a deep and abiding interest in investing and speculating, in this particular case around gold, by all means, come. Understand that some of it's going to be over your head. Uh, you're going to have to look up some of the words. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to have to take notes. And afterwards, you're going to have to refresh your memory with the notes, and you're going to have to play the recording. Um, if that process is too daunting, don't come. Uh, I need to say that all of our other boot camps have had between 700 and 3,500 attendees, depending on the boot camps. And our experience with customer satisfaction has been that substantially less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of our students have requested a refund. Excellent. Final thoughts going into the end of the year here. Uh, um, yeah. Give me those. Right, it's going to be choppy. Uh, the hate trade is off most resources which is to say the hate trade is off the silver juniors. So they tripled. The hate trade is off uranium. The hate trade is even off the gold stocks. So the easy speculative money has been made. For a trader, the next trade is this. Uh, the junior stocks that haven't moved will sell off hard during tax loss season. But people have some gains to shelter. People like myself who have taken profits on the uranium juniors, their silver juniors, and some other stocks will be looking to offset those gains by selling the stocks that they lost money on. That means the tax loss selling season, uh, I think, will begin early this year. I think it's begun already. And I think for the tertiary sector, that is to say the junior juniors, that they're going to get pounded. Uh, and that will set the stage for a real bounce. There will be a dead cat bounce in the worst of the worst uh, after January 10, when the reason for selling goes away, all the way to PDAC. So the period from now till New Year's, uh, I think we'll see the penny dreadfuls sell off hard. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The period, if you trade this stuff, the period... Uh, January 5, January 10 to PDAC, I think you'll see 20 or 25% rebounds uh, in those stocks that have sold off. So if you're looking for a trade or, or a series of trades, that's probably it. Uh, look for formerly large market caps, things that were 250, 300 million market caps that are down in the 30 or $40 million range. Look for them to sell off 30, 40, 50%, and then look for them to rebound 20, 30, 40%. Uh, pretty simple trade if you're willing to do the work. You can't really allocate too much capital to that because the things won't hold them. But it's a trade that when I was a younger man, uh, did things like paid for my university tuition and my truck. Uh -huh. And I hope it fulfills that function for you. But longer term, there is enough money to be made in a gold bull market or a uranium bull market, or an oil bull market, that you don't need to consider the penny dreadfuls at all. There is enough money in beta, doubles, triples, quadruples. And that bull market is sure enough in the five to 10 year time frame that simply owning a portfolio of the best of the best 
and then going on about your life, you know, paying time with your kids, fishing, whatever it is you enjoy doing, uh, is a great strategy. Learn how to do it, uh, through listening to podcasts like this and through the free instructional facilities at the rural classroom. Well said, I will put links to everything in the show notes. Rick, thanks again for your time. I can't tell you how much uh, I enjoy it and how much value you offer myself and all of the listeners. And uh, I hope to see you again before the end of the year. Always a pleasure, Andy. I hope you put on your calendar uh, the Natural Resources Investing Symposium next August in Boca Raton, Florida, the uh, single finest natural resources investing conference on the planet. Attend it live, that's what I would prefer, or if for whatever reason you can't, attend it from the comfort and convenience of your own home via live stream. In either case, that same full money-back guarantee applies. Okay, so I wasn't going to bring it up, but uh, am I invited again? Absolutely. Yeah. To all the listeners that are going to tune into this, that what, hey, I've been to so many of these. I'd never been to yours. That was my first time last year. It was by far the best one I had ever been to. And yes, I was a media sponsor. It was fantastic. The quality of the companies, I'm gushing, the quality of the companies there were just fantastic. That was, it's, it, you know, we've done it for 28 years, I think. I, I'm told that. My memory isn't that accurate, but I'm told we've done it for 28 years. Every year we've managed to make it a little better. And if you make it a little better every year for 28 years, it ends up being pretty good. And we got some great ideas next year about how to make it better for this coming year. And we're going to do it. Uh, it is absolutely positively going to get better. Thank you, too, for being there. The uh, ability that we have to amplify our message via social media, the uh, ability that we have to have different voices commenting on what we do so that our attendees don't just get the rule echo chamber. Uh, is useful. The ability that we offer our hand-selected group of exhibitors to amplify their message through social media uh, is a new but really important part of our conference. So uh, just as you enjoyed being there, we enjoyed having you there, and we look forward to hosting you next year. Well, thank you. Well, shameless plug, book the cruise. They can pull out of... You can go... All right, Red. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I hope to see you before the end of the year. I'll reach out to your staff to book that. But if I don't, happy uh, Happy New Year, early New Year to you. I look forward to it, and I would love to. I would love to visit with you uh, post year end. Maybe, maybe we'll digress into foolish topics like the election. Fantastic. All right. Take care, my friend. Bye bye.